Back in the 1990s, almost every computer display manufactured was a cathode ray tube, or CRT for short. Typically enclosed in a plastic case, a CRT is essentially a vacuum tube that emits electrons, which are manipulated to display images on a phosphor-coated screen. The problem with these phosphors, however, was that they were susceptible to a phenomenon known as burn-in. If the user left a fixed image on the screen for a long period of time, the picture would burn onto the screen, and it's usually permanent. Despite attempts at resolving the burn-in problem, such as making later phosphors longer lasting, it was still susceptible to the issue. Aside from the obvious solution of shutting off the monitor or computer when not in use, there was another alternative, screen savers, which were literally just that, screen savers. At first, they started off simple, but would eventually evolve into creative, innovative, and sometimes strange creations. One such screen saver product stood out from the rest, one that not only brought innovation to the table, but also got the ball rolling on a potentially lucrative market, as well as giving the small software studio behind it their first big hit, with a little help from a few masterminds with Mighty Wings. This is the story of the rise and fall of the ultimate screensaver collection, After Dark. Before we start talking about After Dark, we should start talking about screensavers. Technically speaking, they've been around in computers since the late 70s. Atari's home computers had a feature where colors would cycle after a few minutes of inactivity to prevent burn-in. Certain Atari 2600 games like Breakout also had something similar. The ill-fated Apple Lisa, the first computer with a graphical user interface, technically also had a screensaver, where after a period of inactivity adjustable by the end user, the screen would dim. But what is often widely considered the first screensaver made for personal computers traces back to a young programmer by the name of John Shocha, who published the source code for a screen blanker in the December 1983 issue of Soft Talk for the IBM PC. The purpose of this program was just that. It blanked the screen rather than dimmed it, after a period of inactivity, and, much like early screensavers, can be woken up with a simple key press. John Shocha would later go on to create his most well-known product, Norton Commander. By the mid-1980s, however, some programmers got an idea to show graphics or patterns on the screen, rather than just blank it. One such example was the Macintosh desk accessory Stars, which depicted a bunch of stars moving toward the screen. Another example was the Macintosh application Moray by Daniel Laliberte, which depicted, you guessed it, a moving Moray pattern. There was also another version of Moray for the Mac developed by John Lim, but unlike the previous two, this one was a control panel device and functioned like an actual screensaver. Moray was considered one of the first addictive screensavers, so much so that there's a story of a college professor who had to remove it from his computer, simply because he would watch it instead of paying attention to a phone conversation. These aforementioned graphical screensavers were often experimental and free. However, it soon became apparent that screensavers had commercial potential, and that was the case when 5th generation systems released the animated fireworks screensaver Pyro in 1987. There was also another Starfield screensaver, Blackout, released to shareware in 1989 by Andrew Welch, who would later develop Eclipse through his company Ambrosia Software, and worked similar to Blackout, only it displayed the time. All of these products had one thing in common. They had only one screensaver, meaning that the consumer would have to choose which one to buy, and it was kind of inconvenient. This is where modular screensavers come in. The concept started off as a personal project for Jack Eastman, who at the time was working as a physicist at the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. Jack had a knack for drawing graphics on the Macintosh and thought up an idea to create a screensaver from it. However, the programming ended up being more difficult than anticipated, so Jack brought in his fellow colleague Patrick Beard to help program these animations, which would then be turned into modules, while Jack would build the core engine around it. In other words, as Jack Eastman would put it, build the TV, then change the channel. By the time a working prototype had been finished, Patrick had left the lab to work at Berkeley System Design, which at the time primarily focused on utility software, such as Enlarge, Stepping Out, and Outspoken. You can learn more about these in great detail in another episode. Jack passed a prototype along to him, and later one of Patrick's colleagues at work noticed it, who then passed it along to then-president Wes Boyd. Wes really liked the concept, especially given the limited options for screensavers at the time, and he eventually got in touch with Patrick's friend Jack Eastman. Soon after, they struck a deal, and the product started to come to form. 
Alongside West Boyd, some other creatives came into the mix, including former screenwriter Nicholas Rush and Berkeley programmer Bruce Burkhalter. The product was originally going to be named Nightlife, but after realizing the name had already been taken, they settled on After Dark, as most of the screensavers had a sense of darkness in them. After Dark was then officially introduced for the Macintosh in August of 1989 at the Macworld Expo in Boston, and retailed for $39.95 US dollars. After Dark was Berkeley's second mass-market product following Stepping Out, and it was also their first product released under their new corporate name, Berkeley Systems, most likely to avoid confusion with another BSD. Much like Stepping Out, the After Dark package came in a box, with cover art done by co-founder Joan Blades. Inside the box was an instruction manual, along with the usual 3.5-inch floppy disk, which had no copy protection, much like their previous products. The software itself required a Macintosh 512KE with System 4.1 or higher. An installation was as simple as just copying the files to the system folder and then restarting the computer. After Dark was accessible through the control panel. Upon first run, the user was greeted with a registration screen, asking them to personalize their product with their name and organization. They could also set a password, should they choose to, but more on that later. The After Dark interface consisted of multiple functions. The user could toggle it on or off by clicking on a switch at the top right corner of the panel. The list of screensaver modules were located on the left side, and the user could preview each one before they set it as their default, using the demo button below. Right next to the demo button was the amount of memory required for each screensaver. After Dark also had a hidden credit screen, which could be accessed by clicking on the banner at the top. After Dark included 15 screensaver modules, ranging from pretty patterns to moving pictures to basic animations. Among those was Starry Night, which depicted a night sky with an occasional red comet passing by. This comet can also be seen in both After Dark's original logo and in the Berkeley Systems logo as part of the K. Starry Night is built into the core program, and therefore cannot be removed. It also serves as a fallback screensaver in case of a compatibility problem. The rest of the modules are stored within a separate After Dark Files folder in the System folder and offered customization options, located on the right of the panel. These modules consist of Bouncing Ball, Can of Worms, Clock, Fade Away, Hard Rain, Life, an adaptation of John Conway's Game of Life, Lysages, Logo, Messages, Picture Frame, Shapes, String Theory, Warp, and Zot. All of these modules were compatible with both black and white and color Macintoshes, with the exception of Picture Frame, which required a color display. After Dark also included instructions for creating custom modules in either C or Pascal, allowing programmers to get even more creative. Berkeley Systems would later embrace this kind of creativity, but we'll get to that later. After Dark also provided other features that were available in past screensaver products, such as Hot Corners, where the user could configure which corner to put the cursor in to activate the screensaver or to never activate it. The user could also adjust the time interval, which determines how long the computer must be inactive before the screensaver auto-activates. As mentioned before, the user could also set a password upon first run. However, it doesn't activate by default. Instead, they would have to hold down the command and option keys while pointing to a hot corner. From there, they would have to type in the password upon waking the computer. The password cannot be changed after setup. The only way to reset it was to reinstall the software entirely. Despite After Dark being one of the first commercially released modular screensaver products, it had a lackluster introduction upon release. Eventually, though, the product slowly started to catch on, in a way that the company didn't expect. But the team knew they were onto something. So, in the following year, After Dark received two updates in February and April, respectively. The 1.1 update fixed numerous bugs and added compatibility with the Macintosh 2 CI. Starry Night also gained randomly generated skylines, and three new screensavers were added, Doodles, Nightlines, and Puzzle. The 1.1c update squashed more bugs and brought in an additional five screensavers, Drano, Shredded Crystals, Spheres, Tactiles, and Starry Skyline, a customizable version of Starry Night. 1.1c also added a randomizer module, where users could choose which modules they want randomly selected or in order at a specified time interval. Now, this wasn't the first time a randomizer had been considered. John Rotenstein, the co-creator of the puzzle module, had developed Before Dark a few months earlier. 
However, it was a system extension, or in it, that basically allowed After Dark to automatically select a random module every time the computer is started up, and isn't as feature-packed as the official randomizer. Following After Dark's release, Jack Eastman would join the company as Vice President of Engineering, while Nick Rush became Vice President of Product. With After Dark slowly catching on, it was guaranteed a sequel would be made, and in August of 1990, Berkeley Systems unleashed After Dark 2 for the Macintosh at the Macworld Expo in Boston. By the request of Wes Boyd and Nick Rush, artistry, personality, and creativity was brought in for this release, and no more was that obvious than in the new box art. Aside from the comet and starry skylines, the original After Dark didn't really have much of an identity, while the new version definitely did. After Dark 2 included 30 screensaver modules, most of them updated from the first release. Several modules received major updates. Clock now had multiple faces. Drano was renamed to Down to Drain. Messages could now float or scroll across the screen. And Picture Frame was made compatible with black and white Macs. Sound was added to most of the screensavers, which could be toggled on or off. Each module also now had a description, giving users insight on what a selected module does. There were also some brand new screensavers, including Pix Player, Rainstorm, Rose, Satori, Slideshow, Spotlight, Supernova, and Vertigo. But these additions aren't as notable as the final two now popular screensavers. The first was Fish, which was derived from a similar product developed by Tom and Ed's Bogus Software, a company founded by Tom Saxton and Ed Fries, the latter of whom would go on to lead the team behind the original Xbox. The Fish module was essentially a virtual aquarium, with a variety of fish that could be customized or added through the control panel. But none were ever as popular or as famous as the Flying Toasters. The story goes that Jack Eastman, during a late-night programming session, was looking around for new screensaver ideas that involved flying objects. While he was pacing around his kitchen that night, he happened to spot something that caught his eye. A toaster. And, in a sleep-deprived state, imagined it with wings. At least, that's what Jack Eastman said. Nick Rush, however, tells a slightly different version of the story in an interview with German gaming magazine PC Player. And yes, I did have to translate the whole thing. One of Jack's goals for After Dark 2 was to incorporate sprites with at least four frames of animation, and scribbled down the first thing that caught his eye, which in this case was a toaster. But when he drew it up, he realized that he hadn't chosen the ideal object for flight. So he drew wings on it, and added bread as a secondary object. Regardless of which story you believe, the outcome is the same. Jack pitched his idea the very next day to the higher-ups, who had a good laugh. He was then given the task to do some tweaking, he once again passed the programming along to Patrick Beard, while Jack brought in fellow Japanese artist Tomoya Ikeda to redesign the sprites. And thus was born the Flying Toasters, which depicted Art Deco-style chrome toasters sporting bird-like wings flying across the screen, while occasionally making an appearance in the fish tank. Don't know how that works without it spontaneously electrocuting itself. It's best not to think about it. Accompanying the toasters were flying pieces of toast, whose brownness, much like turning a dial on an actual toaster, could be adjusted in one of the module sliders. Another new module added to After Dark 2 was the multi-module, which allowed the user to combine multiple screensavers into one, and customize them however they want. The multi-module included four templates to choose from, with the ability to create new ones. Sadly, however, some screensavers from the first release, Life, Shredded Crystals, and Tactiles, didn't make the cut. Aside from the new and improved modules, After Dark 2 also brought in some new and much-needed features. The password field was removed from the registration screen and moved to the setup panel, where the user could toggle password protection on or off at any time. They could also now change the password without having to reinstall the software. Sleep corners could now be turned off, and there's also an option to disable the icon that appears during startup. Support for the Notification Manager was also added, along with a System IQ function, which, when enabled, allows After Dark to monitor system activity, slowing down or disabling the software to match the system load. After Dark 2 was not only considered a huge improvement over the first, but it also became Berkeley's biggest claim to fame. Thanks to its eye-catching visuals and new features, it not only swamped the original After Dark in sales, becoming one of the best-selling software products at the time, but it also left its other software in the dust. After Dark 2 also established a new category of utilitainment software, a simple utility that didn't just prevent screen burn-in, but also brain burnout. 
every now and then, a piece of computer software comes along that is so thoroughly over-engineered, so utterly mission uncritical, and so manifestly productivity diminishing that it can't help but become a major smash hit bestseller. That's certainly the case with After Dark. Lee Gomes, The Washington Post. The Flying Toasters also contributed to After Dark's success, giving the small studio an iconic identity with consumers, and eventually became their mascot. However, they were subject to a couple of lawsuits in later years. One of them involved the rock group Jefferson Airplane, who, in 1994, accused Berkeley of copyright infringement over the cover art for their 1973 album, 30 Seconds Over Winterland, which coincidentally featured winged appliances. The case was ultimately dismissed as the copyright only covered the sound recording and not the cover art, which was never registered prior to After Dark's release. After Dark 2 also arguably began the screensaver craze. Pyro tossed its hat into the ring, turning their simple fireworks screensaver into a modular product. ICOM Simulations, and later Delrina of Winfax fame, also released their own modular screensaver product, Intermission, developed by Ant Software. Intermission was considered one of After Dark's major competitors at the time, although they flew a little too close to the sun when they released Opus and Bill Brainsaver in 1993, an Intermission product with licensed characters created by the ironically named Berkeley Breathed. The original version included a module called Death Toasters, which depicted Opus the Penguin shooting down the flying toasters. Despite it being an obvious parody, Berkeley Systems apparently couldn't take the joke, and sued Delrina for copyright infringement. Ultimately, the judge ruled against Delrina, forcing them to change the toaster's wings to propellers in later releases. Other lesser-known alternatives also started to pop up, such as Dark Side of the Mac and Quick Tool Sunset, the latter of which was developed by, you guessed it, Andrew Welch. On the Windows side, Microsoft introduced their first entertainment pack for the then-newly-released Windows 3 in 1990. The pack offered multiple games, as well as a program called Idlewild, which offered similar screensavers to After Dark, including the now-famous Starfield Simulation. Sierra Online, then known for their graphical adventure games, took the screensaver concept a step further by turning it into a story-driven art form with Johnny Castaway in 1992. The product was released under the Screen Antics brand, which only lasted one title, and was produced by Jeff Tunnell, who later became well-known for games like The Incredible Machine and the 3D Ultra series. By the close of 1990, Berkeley Systems, with about 15 employees, had its annual revenue of 1 million US dollars the previous year doubled to 2 million US dollars. With the success of After Dark on the Mac, it made sense to bring it over to the ever-growing Windows platform. But despite seeing Windows as a potential new market, Berkeley had practically no experience with the platform, as they were a Mac-centric developer at the time. So they opted to outsource the work to Software Dynamics, a company run by Bill Stewart and Ian McDonald, who had previously developed a screensaver product for Windows, dubbed Magic, in 1988. The first version of After Dark for Windows was released in March of 1991 for 49 US dollars. It functioned similar to the Mac version, but it also brought in some new and exclusive features. For one, the user could set a hotkey combination instead of a hot corner to activate the screensaver, without having to rely on third-party software like in the Mac version. There was also an exclusive new feature called Window Shutter, which essentially offered an extra security layer. So when the user tries to reboot or enter back into Windows, it'll ask for a password before it can progress any further. This would eventually become a standard feature in Windows NT, released two years later. Finally, there was the option of installing a screen blanker for use in the DOS environment. After Dark for Windows included 36 screensaver modules, many of which were ported from the Mac version. Some modules, however, received changes, both in name and visually. Fish was renamed to Aquatic Realm, Fadeaway offered more transitions, and Warp became more of a black hole-like environment, rather than flying through space. There were also a number of exclusive modules, including Geobounce, Globe, Graphstat, Gravity, Lasers, Magic, Modrian, Mountains, Nocturnes, Punch-Out, Spiral Gyra, Stained Glass, and Wraparound. Despite these new additions, After Dark for Windows did lack some features from the Mac version, such as digitized sound and the multi-module. But that would change in version 2, released in March of the following year, which added support for sound cards, giving some screensavers digitized sound for the first time on the Windows platform. The new version also added the multi-module, with multiple pre-made templates to choose from, much like the Mac version. 
Unlike the Mac version, however, this multi-module was far more customizable. The original multi-module templates relied on existing module settings, so any changes made to a module used in a template would be applied there. In the Windows version, however, each module in a template could individually be adjusted without affecting the existing module, and there's also extra shape tools for more variety. In addition, version 2 added a new help system, the ability to set a network password and a master password, support for Super VGA graphics, and the ability to set a password for the DOS screen blanker. But by far the most notable new feature was Wall Zapper, where the user could save screensavers as wallpapers by simply pressing Control shift z Finally, version 2 added five new and exclusive screensavers, including Hall of Mirrors, Marbles, Penrose, Sounder, and Swan Lake. Shortly after the release of the first Windows version, Berkeley Systems was putting the final touches on its first expansion pack for After Dark on the Mac. The year prior, Berkeley held a display contest on who would come up with the most creative modules. Several of those winners, along with some brand new modules made in-house, were cobbled together into an add-on pack titled More After Dark, released in August of 1991 for $39.95 US dollars. This is where the creativity really started to shine. More After Dark brought in 25 additional screensavers, some of which contain artwork drawn by then full-time artist Igor Kasowski, who would later become vice president of art and design. Among these new modules was Boris, which depicted a cat moving around the screen, occasionally chasing a butterfly here and there. The other new modules consisted of Dominoes, Moen Man, Meadow, Rain, Ripple, Say What? Snake, Terraform, and Tunnel. Select modules from the Windows version were also brought to the Mac through this pack, with only a couple being expanded or renamed. Modrian became part of a new module called Modern Art, while Wraparound was renamed to String Art. More After Dark also offered screensavers with interactivity through the caps lock key. These included Confetti Factory, Life 2, Mandelbrot, and the most notable one of the bunch, Lunatic Fringe, a space shooter video game disguised as a screensaver. For a while, Berkeley also licensed the Virex antivirus from Microcom, turning it into a screensaver that also scanned the computer for viruses. However, its existence was short-lived as it was removed in subsequent reissues. Finally, More After Dark added new fish to the fish screensaver, as well as an update to the After Dark engine that offered full compatibility with the then newly released System 7. Both this and After Dark for Windows would further boost the franchise's popularity, continuing its reign as one of the best-selling software products for both platforms. After Dark has been a best-selling screensaver in the Macintosh, Macintosh. Yeah. and now they have it for the PC. Oh, it's great. wonderful. I think people will love getting okay. it. By the end of 1991, Berkeley's annual revenue would double to four million US dollars, with no signs of slowing down. In just two years, Wes Boyd had accomplished what many couldn't in the industry. He went from working with his father to becoming a multi-million dollar entrepreneur. But as the team grew, the company started to outgrow their small buildings on Shattuck Avenue. So during that year, they relocated their headquarters to a larger building on Rose Street, formerly of Pacific Bell that was donated to the Disabled Children's Computer Group, which is quite ironic given the company's origins and accessibility. With After Dark skyrocketing in popularity, the franchise would see even more products on the horizon, beginning with guidebooks. The first one released was Cool Mac After Dark, written by Ross Scott Rubin for the Cool Mac series, and was released during the summer of 1992. The book contained information on every After Dark screensaver available for the Mac at the time, as well as coverage of screensavers created by third parties. It also contained a floppy disk with 17 freeware modules, some of which would end up in future iterations of After Dark. I already went into detail on this book in a previous episode, so go check it out if you want to learn more. But that wasn't the only book about After Dark. There was also Art of Darkness, written by Erfurt Fenton and released a few months later. Unlike the first book, this one was officially endorsed by Berkeley Systems, and therefore goes into a lot more history and detail on each module, while also providing tips and tricks, multi-module template suggestions, and a rather amusing anecdote about an exchange between Nick Rush and a customer that goes by the name of Mr. X. I also covered this in detail in a past episode, so again, go check that out for more context. Much like with Cool Mac, Art of Darkness also contained a floppy disk with 10 new screensaver modules, many of which were developed by Berkeley Systems. These consist of Blackboard, Boglins, Fractal Forest, 
Major Metaphysical Appliances, Movies Till Dawn, Pearls, Spin Brush, Strange Attractors, Sunburst, and Jack's original flying toaster prototypes, the Proto Toasters. And much like with Cool Mac, some of these modules would also end up in future iterations of After Dark, as we'll get to later. In November of 1992, Berkeley Systems released their first themed After Dark product, utilizing the Star Trek license. This edition, released as Star Trek The Screensaver, contained a bunch of modules centered around characters or things related to the classic Star Trek series. Some of these special modules are often based on existing ones like this Messages one, for example. However, others, like this interactive quiz, are entirely new. This edition was also made so that it could be purchased as either an add-on or as a standalone product, as it contained the core After Dark engine, along with the randomizer module. The multi-module was also included, however, themed editions afterwards did not include one, as we'll get to later. Star Trek The Screensaver was also the first Berkeley product to have a new installer for both Mac and Windows, sprinkled with some humorous messages about registration cards and so on. I love it when companies do that. But by far the most notable change was the requirement of a serial number during installation, most likely to combat piracy. At the time, it was estimated that After Dark was one of the most frequently pirated programs on both platforms, so for a product that had an expensive license attached to it, it made sense to put in some form of copy protection, a rather effective measure that was brought over to the regular edition shortly after. Yes, I am indeed a happy customer. Oh, my shoes untied? Thanks for reminding me. Hey, wait a minute, my shoes don't have laces. Star Trek The Screensaver would become yet another success, with more themed editions being pumped out over the next few years. By the end of 1992, Berkeley's annual revenue had soared to 14 million US dollars, with steady increases over the next few years. And at the heart of it all was After Dark, which by that time had sold over a million copies and had made its way into the homes of millions of computer users. To help fuel its rapid growth and expansion, the company gained outside venture capital, while Patrick Beard, now having finished up work on After Dark, would leave the company to focus on college. The following year would see even more After Dark on the horizon, starting with the more After Dark add-on on Windows, released during the summer of 1993. Aside from the modules ported from the Mac version, it also included several modules ported from Art of Darkness, the Hallucinations module from Cool Mac After Dark, and five exclusive modules, Bulge, Phlox, Guts, Mosaic, and Origami. Later that year in September, Berkeley released their second themed After Dark product, the Disney Collection, which, as you might have guessed, includes modules centered around Disney characters and movies. This was also the first After Dark product not to include the multi-module. Around the same time, After Dark received a port for DOS, which was outsourced to Dan Duncalf and Charles Hurt. This version included select modules from more After Dark, as well as the return of the original Life screensaver, though it's not as interesting as the one from the Mac version. The DOS version also excluded the randomizer and multi-module, making this the first After Dark product to include neither one. Although the DOS version wasn't as popular as the others, it did include at least one exclusive module, Atomic. Berkeley also experimented with After Dark screen posters, which included multiple images that can be used in a slideshow screensaver. Its selling point, however, was that the user could also make them their default wallpaper. The first screen posters product was released in December of 1993, utilizing the Marvel Comics license. This was then followed up by a Star Trek edition, released in May of the following year, and would also be the last officially released After Dark product that used the 2.0 engine. By the start of 1994, Berkeley Systems had employed over 100 people, with almost half of them being artists. They continued to be put to the test with the third major release of After Dark, released in August of 1994, and was the first version developed in-house for both Mac and Windows. After Dark 3 brought in a plethora of new features. For starters, modules were now categorized by folder, which made organizing them much easier. This included the multi-module and randomizer. Then, there was a completely revamped setup screen, which also brought most of the exclusive settings from the Windows version to the Mac for the first time, including the Sleep Hotkey, setting a password on startup, wall zapper, and the redesigned multi-module panel. A proper screen blanker was also added, which could be activated either through a module or by holding down Shift while in a hot corner, regardless of the selected module. Other new features consist of the ability to disable mouse movement for waking up the computer, along with some new advanced options for Windows users, such as custom 16-color VGA palettes. 
but by far the most notable new feature in After Dark 3 was Ecologic. Originally introduced a year prior, and was initially only bundled with select monitors from Neneo and Sony. Ecologic offered energy saver options for Energy Star compliant monitors. These include settings like Play Screensaver, Shutdown Monitor, and for the Macintosh, Shutdown Computer after a specified amount of time, all of which could be adjusted individually. There's also an annual savings count for how much energy and money the user would supposedly save with Ecologic. They can even configure the type of monitor and kilowatt per hour in energy cost, which will update the count. Alongside the new features, After Dark 3 included 30 screensavers, half of which are fan favorites from the previous iterations, with little to no updates. These included Guts and Marbles from the Windows version, Movies Till Dawn from Art of Darkness, and Frost and Fire from Cool Mac After Dark. Some screensavers, however, saw big upgrades, most notably Clocks, Fish Pro, and Flying Toasters Pro. The latter in particular had improved graphics for the toasters, making them more animated. There was also optional music that could either be set to play Wagner's Ride of the Valkyries, or an original song, the Flying Toaster Anthem, accompanied with optional karaoke lyrics written by Nick Rush. The other half consisted of new and original screensavers, including Artist, Bugs, Daredevil Dan, Dos Shell, Draw Morph, Nirvana, Nonsense, Photon, Rat Race, Ray, Rebound, Vista, and Zoom. There was also a module called You Bet Your Head, an interactive trivia game which could be played with up to three players. Oh, and let's not forget about the fan favorite, Bad Dog, who would later get a loose animated adaptation that aired in the late 90s on Fox Family. And for those wondering who the dog's name was, well, I'll leave that up to you. In October of 1994, three more themed After Dark packages were released, all using the After Dark 3 engine. The Simpsons screensaver, Star Trek, the next generation screensaver, Engage. and the X-Men screensaver. Rewinding to September of 1994, Berkeley Systems began releasing software on CD-ROM, starting with the complete After Dark, their first Mac Windows hybrid release, which eliminated the need to buy two separate versions of the software on floppy. The package included screensavers from After Dark 3, After Dark 2, More After Dark, and Art of Darkness, as well as some bonus content and audio tracks, the latter of which are all variations of the Flying Toaster Anthem. Flying out of the sun. The smell of trust is in the air. Not long after, Berkeley started re-releasing some of their products as hybrid CD-ROMs, starting with the Disney Collection and the Simpsons Screensaver in February of 1995. In April, Berkeley released their final After Dark product with licensed characters, the Looney Tunes Animated Screensaver, which is also notable for being the first software product Tim Sniffen worked on at the company as an artist. In August, After Dark 3 was reissued as a hybrid CD-ROM, and was also updated to work with Windows 95. It also contained some extra screensavers from the previous iterations of After Dark on Windows. Around the same time, the company released yet another themed After Dark product, Totally Twisted, which consisted of 13 shocking, gross, gory, and otherwise twisted screensavers, making it their first product aimed at mature audiences. Hey you, wanna know what time it is? <laughs> Coming soon from Berkeley Systems! Among the new modules was Flying Toilets, which was also available in the Windows 95 edition of After Dark. By 1995, the After Dark franchise had sold over 2 million copies, and at the height of its popularity had many third-party and user-created modules, the majority of which were distributed over online services. There was also After Dark merchandise, including t-shirts, neckties, posters, 
mouse pads, and even an inflatable, many of which predominantly feature the famous winged appliances. After Dark has also been referenced in popular culture, showing up in movies like Malice, The Net, Copycat, and Mission Impossible. After Dark has also showed up in a number of hit television shows, and it's even the name of a nightclub in the teen drama series Beverly Hills 90210. But as the screensaver craze started to wane in the mid-90s, the future of Berkeley Systems was being put into question. Microsoft had since integrated screensaver functionality into their Windows operating system, resulting in less of a demand for third-party screensaver products on the PC, including After Dark. Since the Mac didn't have integrated screensaver functionality at the time, however, After Dark remained pretty popular on the platform. There was also the inevitable launch of Windows 95, which would heavily boost PC sales and put the Mac in a rather uncomfortable position in the marketplace. But those weren't as concerning as the advancements in display technology, most notably built-in power-saving features and the introduction of external LCD displays, which resolved the burn-in problem and would guarantee lost sales of After Dark in the future. Wes Boyd, however, wasn't really concerned about it. To tell you the truth, we've never really investigated the value of screensavers because we don't really care. People buy the products for entertainment, for privacy, so colleagues can't read their screen while they're at the water cooler, and to personalize their PCs. Wes Boyd, Fortune Magazine. Despite this, Berkeley Systems were pressured to deliver another hit. So, beginning in 1994, they started diversifying into other consumer products. Their first attempt was Launchpad, initially released for the Macintosh in June of 1994 for 50 US dollars. It was later released for Windows as Launchpad Kids Safe Desktop in February of the following year on a hybrid CD-ROM for 30 US dollars. Launchpad essentially replaced the main file manager with an interactive animated desktop aimed at kids as a way for them to access their files without messing with their parents' files. Its functionality worked similar to that of Apple's Addies and Edmark's Kid Desk, albeit with a more family-friendly interactive interface that would inspire other desktop shells, most notably Packard Bell Navigator and, of course, the infamous Microsoft Bob. Upon first launch of Launchpad, the parent would have to set up an adult password, followed by a child account, with other settings that could be set for the latter, such as approved applications and a child password, in text or a combination of up to four pictures. When the parent wants to return to the Finder, they simply quit the software and enter in the adult password. Launchpad included a plain desktop and the default theme, featuring a dog named Bingo, the precursor to the bad dog from After Dark 3. Other themes were planned for Launchpad, such as one involving the X-Men. Launchpad's default theme had numerous dynamic scenes to choose from, much like an interactive book. A child could click on some parts of the scene for interaction, including ones involving Bingo. The child could also place any applications from the dashboard and put them in a scene, and documents were accessible through a glove compartment. The child could also set the alert sound by simply clicking on the horn. Alongside that, Launchpad included three kid-friendly desk accessories, Kids Calc, Kids Clock, and Kids Talk, the latter of which was a sound recorder with various effects to choose from. Finally, there was After Dark Cinema, which allowed the user to play After Dark modules through Launchpad, including a bonus flying bingo module that could also be used as a screensaver within After Dark. Shortly after the release of Launchpad, Berkeley tried entering the productivity business with Expresso, released in September for both Mac and Windows for $70 and $50 respectively. Expresso was basically a personal information manager that offered a calendar, address book, notes, and to-do list. It also had a feature called Flashback, which allowed the user to make the application their desktop background in whatever arrangement they like. And in typical Berkeley fashion, Expresso was customizable with over 20 bundled themes, each designed by the software's art director, Allard LeBon, who joined the company the year prior. Expresso was one of their last products to work on standard black and white compact Macintoshes, and was also their final floppy-only release. Despite the efforts, however, both Launchpad and Expresso were not huge successes, although Expresso did get a Star Trek edition, titled Stardate, a month later. Regardless, both were discounted pretty quickly by the following year. Then there was the company's third and final attempt at diversifying into another lucrative market, video games. In the spring of 1995, Berkeley Systems released their first video game product, an adaptation of Dan Gilbert's Triazel Rainforest Edition, in both floppy and hybrid CD-ROM, for 30 US dollars. 
The game had multiple puzzles, ranging from Triazzle Jr. to Star Triazzle to a standard Triazzle, each with five levels of difficulty. Each new puzzle randomly generates a different environment, usually consisting of frogs, insects, or both. The player could also create a custom board, with any combination of Triazzle type, piece style, background, puzzle edges, and the number of hints. The player could also toggle a timer, which serves primarily as a stopwatch determining how long it takes for the player to complete the puzzle. By default, there are rainforest sounds and jingles that come on during gameplay. However, the player does have the option to mute them. Finally, aside from the regular tutorials, there's also a dedicated section to learning about rainforest wildlife, creatures, and habitats. And if that weren't enough, it also makes mention that a portion of the sale proceedings from the game would go towards the Rainforest Alliance, a nonprofit group dedicated to saving endangered rainforests. Triazzle also included a bonus After Dark screen saver, utilizing assets from the game. Much like Launchpad and Expresso, Triazzle was also not a major success. It seemed as if they would never recapture the success of After Dark. But Berkeley Systems, with over 120 employees at this point, wasn't ready to give up, and would eventually find success with a certain irreverent trivia party game that would reshape the studio's future in the years to come. But that's a story for another time. By 1996, After Dark had sold nearly 3 million units, so it would make sense to push out a fourth and final version, released on October 14, 1996. On the Macintosh, it looked and functioned similar to the previous version, with the only differences being a new logo and the removal of the multi-module. The Windows side, however, was a different story. It was no longer a separate program, rather it was integrated into the display control panel of Windows 95, with a new user interface to boot. It also offered the ability to mini-preview a screensaver directly in the After Dark UI. After Dark 4 consisted of 22 screensavers, some of which were upgrades from the previous, including Bad Dog, Fish World, Marbles, Messages, Time Flies, and the Triazzle screensaver Rainforest. Flying Toasters received a massive upgrade, with an all-new opening showing their evolution, before revealing the toaster's new design, which has much more expressive animation. There's also the addition of bagels and pastries to go alongside the toast, a new remix of the Flying Toaster anthem, and the ability to choose between adult toasters and baby toasters, the latter of which also contains a reference to the aforementioned irreverent trivia game in the lyrics. The rest of the modules are entirely new, consisting of Art Critic, Cyberwatt, Guernsey Madness, Hula Twins, Life and All, Magic Turtle, Out and About, Points of View, Psychodeli, Shadow Agents, Slow Burn, Super Guy, and Swirling Magic. After Dark 4 also brought in more interactivity in some modules. In Time Flies and Swirling Magic, the user could change the appearance of the objects. In Marbles and Magic Turtle, the user could customize the screen with different bumpers, and change how the effects are created respectively. In Rock, Paper, Scissors, the user could either watch the battle or battle against a computer opponent. And finally, there's Roger Dodger, an interactive puzzle game with multiple levels and the ability to save progress. Although After Dark 4 was the most creative of the bunch, it's a far departure from the simple sense of darkness that the first two versions had. A deluxe edition was also released the same day, consisting of After Dark 4, plus a collection of screensavers from the previous three iterations, giving the user over 85 modules to choose from, all for just 40 US dollars. Berkeley also released an After Dark Classic Edition, which included 25 of the most popular After Dark modules from the past, for 20 US dollars. But that wasn't the only new After Dark software released that year. There was also After Dark Online, a collection of modules that connected to the internet and delivered information from news sites such as DBC Online, USA Today, Sports Illustrated, ZDNet, and The Wall Street Journal. Its functionality worked similar to Pointcast, another online screensaver that launched earlier that year. After Dark Online originally launched on October 1st, 1996 as a free download and was later bundled with After Dark 4. 
Five months later, After Dark Online received an update that added Quick Read, which allowed users to read an entire article within a screensaver without launching their browser, as well as Channel Navigator, which offered navigation controls for channels and news updates. By the beginning of 1997, Berkeley's annual revenue had peaked at around 30 million US dollars, employed over 150 people, and had dreams of going public in the stock market. But founder and chairman Wes Boyd had other plans. Knowing where the industry was headed, he decided to turn around and sell the company, and they would find a buyer on April Fool's Day. CUC International, the then parent of software giants Davidson, Sierra, and Knowledge Adventure. The deal, valued at 13.8 million US dollars, was officially announced on April 2nd and would close nine days later, with Berkeley Systems integrated into Sierra Online as yet another development studio. With the sale, Wes Boyd and his wife Joan Blades would retire from the software industry and later got into politics, but I'm pretty sure you already knew that. Despite new owners, however, Sierra continued to sell the existing After Dark products under the Berkeley Systems label for a while. In 1998, Sierra would reissue most of its core After Dark packages, 4.0, Deluxe, Classic, and Totally Twisted, under their newly formed Sierra Attractions label, with most of them getting new cover art. But there was also another surprise for After Dark fans, and it was in the form of a video game. After Dark Games was a compilation of 11 minigames, all based on previously released screensavers. There was Moen Maniac, a Pac-Man clone, Toaster Run, an isometric glider clone, Hula Girl, an endless vertical platformer, Bad Dog 911, and Fish Stick, both word scramble games, Foggy Boxes, a dots and boxes game, and of course, Roger Dodger. There were also generic games with an After Dark theme, such as Roof Rats, a tile matching puzzle game, Zapper, a trivia game, Mushu Tiles, a Mahjong clone, and everyone's favorite card game, Solitaire. After Dark Games was released on October 29, 1998 for both Mac and Windows platforms, and was also the last product that Jack Eastman worked on at the company. The following year would not be too kind to the After Dark franchise. Not only have much of the key creatives that had spearheaded the company moved on to other ventures, but Berkeley also underwent another change in ownership. The year prior, CUC, which had just merged with a hospitality company forming Sendent, found itself in the middle of what was considered a massive financial scandal at the time, and were forced to sell off its software division they had built up to French media company Havas, a subsidiary of Vivendi. Because of this, 1999 would be a lackluster year for the After Dark franchise, with only two new compilation packages released, the Midnight Collection and the 10th Anniversary Collector's Edition. The 10th Anniversary Edition was quite possibly the most unique of the bunch. Just like the other compilation packs, it included the best After Dark screensavers from the past, and it also included three minigames from After Dark Games. However, it also included two exclusive modules, specifically built for this edition. The first was Toaster 2K, a variation of the Flying Toaster screensaver with modern toasters, toaster transformers, and a modern remix of the Flying Toaster Anthem. The second was Hall of Fame, which was essentially a montage of After Dark characters drawn in anime form. These included classics like Bad Dog, Boris, Lunatic Fringe, Skimpy Hula Twins, Dragon Ball-esque Super Guy, and Pokemon-like Rat Race. Yeah, this was a pretty strange one to say the least. But hey, at least you get some cool desktop wallpapers if you're a Windows user. Speaking of which, the After Dark 10th Anniversary Edition, along with After Dark 4, only worked with Windows 95 and 98, and was incompatible with any version of Windows NT. As for Mac users, the software only worked with Mac OS 7.5.5 all the way up to 8.6. This is notable because about a month later, Apple shipped Mac OS 9 to the public, and with it, After Dark started having some problems before it stopped functioning entirely. As Sierra never officially released a patch for Mac OS 9, community patches became available online, so you can still run your favorite After Dark modules on newer Mac hardware. Ultimately, the 10th Anniversary Edition would be the last officially released After Dark product from the studio that originally made it. So, what happened next? By the start of the millennium, the After Dark franchise had sold over 5 million units worldwide, but the studio that made them was already on life support. 
On April 20, 2000, Sierra's parent company Havas acquired Price Central Networks, who then merged it with One.net to form Flipside.com. As a result of the merger, Berkeley Systems was split into two, with the studio going to Flipside while Sierra held on to its IPs, including After Dark. By the end of the year, Berkeley Systems was completely dissolved into Flipside, following the release of the rather forgotten Backstage Pass, which I already looked at in a past episode. From that point on, many assumed that After Dark had come to an end. Or did it? On July 22, 2002, Infinisys, the Japanese distributor for After Dark, released a new version of the product for Mac OS X for 20 US dollars under license from Sierra. Unlike the original releases, this version used Mac OS X's built-in screensaver engine, thus no longer making it a separate piece of software. After Dark 10 originally included eight screensavers, all of which were remasters of existing modules, including Starry Night, Warp, Messages, Line Art, Shower, Circles, Fireworks, and a new Flying Toasters module, Space Toasters. On May 29, 2003, After Dark 10 was updated to include Fish, along with two additional screensavers, Mandelbrot and Moen Man. Kaleidoscope was later added in another update, released on June 2nd of the following year. After Dark 10 was initially only compatible with PowerPC Max. However, starting in 2013, three After Dark screensavers, Flying Toasters, Boris, and Moen Man, were all brought over to Intel. There was also a Screen Studio application that let users create their own screensavers. The classic set, however, is still being sold as of 2024. Fans also sought to recreate the After Dark experience. In 2003, a 3D variation of the Flying Toasters was released as part of the X screensaver package for Mac OS X and Linux, with airplane wings replacing the bird wings. In 2014, Brian Braun rewrote several After Dark screensavers in CSS, which include Fish and Flying Toasters. After Dark has also made cameos in some video games, such as the 2011 reboot of You Don't Know Jack, both the console and mobile versions, as well as the 2015 edition from the first Jackbox Party Pack. Speaking of games, in 2006, Vivendi released a new flying toaster game for mobile phones, which not only included references to After Dark's release year, but also its original creator, Jack Eastman. Two years later, Vivendi merged its video game holdings with Activision to form Activision Blizzard, with Sierra folding into the latter. Vivendi would continue to maintain a majority stake until 2013. Ten years later, on October 13, 2023, Activision Blizzard was purchased for 75 billion US dollars by Microsoft, the same company that bundled screensavers with Windows in the first place. Although Activision technically still holds the rights to After Dark, the trademark has been abandoned since 2016. But what about the key creatives who made it all possible? Whatever happened to them? Jack Eastman would go on to co-found CloudSource, along with his own consulting company, Eightfold Way Consultants, the latter of which is still in business today. His former partner, Patrick Beard, meanwhile, would go on to work for major companies following his graduation, including Netscape and Apple. He still works at the latter today as a senior engineer. Nick Rush would join Pogo as their vice president of content programming, before becoming the chief creative officer of EA's online division, following their acquisition of Pogo in 2001. In 2004, Nick would join iWin as their Vice President of Creative, before jumping to social gaming startup Wonderhill as their Chief Creative Officer in 2008. He rejoined iWin a couple years later as a Creative Director for some of their social games, including Family Feud, before departing for good in 2012. As for what he's up to now, I haven't been able to find anything else beyond that, but let's just hope he's enjoying life for retirement. Bruce Burkhalter left Berkeley Systems in 1995 and has since worked for other companies such as 3DO and was a director of software engineering at Gracenote before his retirement from the industry in 2023. Igor Gasowski would also join CloudSource as their vice president of design. As of 2024, he is currently the president and chief creative officer of Boldium. Software Dynamics, the original developers of After Dark on Windows, are still in business today. Its founder, Bill Stewart, currently works as a design manager for various clients, while the fate of his partner, Ian McDonald, is unknown. Finally, there's Tomoya Ikeda, the artist that brought the flying toasters to life. He would go on to do design work for Palmsoft, particularly with Type Designer. Sadly, in October of 1998, he lost his battle to cancer at the age of 39. After Dark may have not been the first screensaver product to hit the market, but it did make them more mainstream to the general public. 
Screensavers are now standard features in operating systems today, and have continued to evolve over the years. However, with advancements in display technology and the rise of mobile devices, screensavers aren't as prevalent as they used to be, merely just eye candy at best. Despite that, the creativity that came from them is still there, especially within the video game industry. Alert LeBon and Tim Sniffen in particular, as brought up before, started their careers making software with art, and now work as key creatives for the hugely popular Jackbox franchise. In hindsight, After Dark was like no other product for its time. It served a market that lasted for years, and even though there's not much in the screensaver sector nowadays, the creativity that came from them will continue to entertain for years to come. So maybe next time when you see a pretty visual image on a computer screen, you'll remember them for more than just pretty visual images. So at this point, we're about halfway through the Berkeley system story, but there's a lot more to cover. We've already covered their humble beginnings, and now we've covered their first big franchise. But we have yet to cover their second and arguably biggest franchise. One that not only gave the studio a second chance, but would continue its run even after the company's demise. The talent that brought us After Dark were just getting started. And if you don't think that way, then you don't know Jack! <laughs> You Don't Know Jack. We'll be right back after these messages. It's big. It's hot. Why doesn't it kill us all? Learn about the sun tonight. You know what they say. All toasters toast toast. <laughs>